Professor, what do you tell people who say, look, at the end of the day, Mother Nature takes care of herself. Even if it'll take a billion years, whatever it is, Mother Nature takes care of herself. Well, I guess what I would say is that what we're seeing is that all life forms, all species, seem to have some sort of ecological niche. So what's the ecological niche for human beings? And you can, you can evaluate our impact on planetary systems over the last, say, 10,000 years or 40,000 years, if you go back a little further, and you can say, well, it's been fairly negative ecologically. We've driven other species to extinction. We've, we've disrupted uh, biomass and accumulation of organic matter, lowered fertility, caused climate, climate changes, altered different things. So we've had a negative effect. But what have we done? What else have we done? We have developed language. We have developed the ability to think, to communicate with each other. That's a special capacity that many other types of, of life forms don't really have. Now, we're not very good at that. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not very wise. We're very clever, but we're not very wise. And what we need to do now in order to ensure that humanity survives. You know, in one way, yes, nature could survive without human beings, but we would, there would, something would be lost. The fact that a species has emerged in nature that can think about its own death, about the meaning of life, and, and communicate that. That doesn't mean that we do that enough, we, we need to do more of that. We need to think profoundly. I mean, how many people, if you walk up and say, hey, what's the meaning of life? People look at you and say, well, you're, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah. But in fact, that's fairly important. And now I see in, in America and in Europe, you, you have people who are taking drugs because they de they're depressed because they don't know what is the meaning of life. Their life has no meaning. And you don't find that in in Africa, often in, in places that are extremely poor. People are trying to survive. People want something better for their children and they'll work hard and, and do what, what they have to do to ensure that. How do, we, how do we do this? How do we help the people in the, in the West to increase their gross national happiness? And how do we help the people who live in the developing world to increase their standard of living? to protect and, and restore their ecosystems. We need to do all of these things. So, you know, I think Africa has great potential to lead in this regard. Once we understand the principles that are determining why, why do rivers flow, where does the fertility in the soil come from? If we understand that and we discuss that and, and we have collective knowledge about this, then no policy and no action can go against this because it's just in our interest. And when we carry this very far, we find that actually the collective interest of everyone on the planet and the interest of individuals are exactly the same. We can all live well. Yeah. We can all help each other. We can all ensure our children and our children's children inherit the same functionalities on the planet that we have had, mm. and it can be better. Bottom line, Doctor, I have to ask you this question. Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, was that, was that uh, impactful enough, was that? Well, I think that, you know, our films are called Hope in a Changing Climate, and his film is called An Inconvenient Truth, you know. Um, I think we have to, if we can't envision a world which is sustainable. We can't live in one. So it's really our duty. Many things are wrong today. And you know, we, we need to envision how to achieve a society and an economy and a collective world that is sustainable. An inconvenient truth seems to have transmitted the belief 
that human impact on the climate is simply from the emission of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's partially true. <laughs> so it's not only an inconvenient truth, it's a partial truth. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You still have hope, don't you, Professor? There's a lot of hope in well, a changing climate. Yeah, I mean, we've seen yeah. that it's possible to restore large-scale damaged ecosystems. And by doing that, you change the entire dynamic. It affects the hydrological cycle, it affects fertility and productivity, it affects the economy and even the psychology of the people. So one of the things that I've come to believe and I've seen it happen in China is that subsistence agriculture was ended instantly. So as soon as, you know, not like decades or generations go, have to go by to end this type of lifestyle. It can be done immediately if there is an alternative. If, if, if all the people are engaged in conservation activities, the best agriculturalists still do agriculture. But you don't need 80 or 90 percent of the population to work in agriculture. It's just not going to happen. So the others must move first to conservation because that's very close to agriculture. You're still working in the soil and, and with plants. And then others move to design and infrastructure and energy and they replace the, the mistaken actions. So in China, all the negative activities that were damaging the land were banned. And all the positive things that they learned were made policy and, and then spread nationwide. So they're going to have an enormous impact over time. So, I mean, one, I, I did see Al Gore this summer in Oxford and he, he said there, and I'm, I'm glad that he'd moved on, he said China is planting two and a half times more trees than the rest of the planet. So if you, if you understand that it seems that you can almost equate vegetation cover and wealth. So we saw in the United States in the 30s there was massive ecological disruptions and then the, there was a response with the Civilian Conservation Corps. Right. They planted 5% of the American males worked in that program between 1933 and 1942. They planted between three and five billion trees. They made 700 parks, which is essentially making ecological land, although I don't think that's as good a, a me method as having the ecological land and the economic land being right together. So the Chinese are, are, have moved that theory f forward. But uh, the outcome was good. So America was rich in the second half of the 20th century. That would not have been the case if they had huge dust storms, massive desertification, loss of hydrological regulation, and, and loss of fertility and productivity in agriculture. So in fact, those types of interventions on a, on, at scale affect them. We're now at a situation where it, it's, it's everyone on the planet's responsibility to get this right. It's not about America, it's not about China, it's not about Africa, it's about the planet. And so a degraded state anywhere is a degraded state everywhere. That's good news yeah. because we have the technology, we have the capital, we have the labor and we have the need to restore these places. We can do this. Professor, we're going to have to talk more about this. I love this. It's fantastic. Thank you. And congratulations on all this work. Thank you. I look forward to seeing these documentaries on K24. Okay. Good job. Thanks a lot. All right. Well done. Professor John Liu, my goodness, what an interesting topic. Breaking it down for you and I. He says, collective responsibility. Each and every one of us. You can play your role to turn this thing around. Don't blame the West. Don't blame other countries. Look at yourself starts right here charity begins at home and the Mao can indeed be restored if we all play our part that's the bottom line look out for these documentaries hope in a changing climate only on k24 and lessons of the list plateau good grief what a guest what a show what a week it's going to be on capital talk we're talking issues issues that pertain to you and me 
You won't get these kinds of issues anywhere else but right here on the award-winning station, K24. Where, as always, we are all Kenyan. All the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. This is the first of many, man. This Capital Talk is recorded at the Fairview Hotel, the country hotel in town.